Hey everybody, welcome back to Gratuity. I'm your host, Darren Bresnitz. We are so excited to be sitting down with Audra Mulkern, founder of the Female Farmer Project and co-executive producer of the Women's Work documentary. Audra has been a longtime advocate for women's rights in agriculture and a proponent of mental health. In today's episode, we talk about how farming is the backbone for many societies across the globe, as people's relationships with their farmers will be shifting in both the next few weeks and few months as the pandemic plays out, and how women are stepping up to shoulder the load in the field as they've done in the past throughout history. When possible, our guests will join us for a video chat, but thank you to Audra Mulkern for graciously joining us remotely for Colin during her busy schedule. So sit back and please enjoy some gratuity. Audra, thank you so much for joining us on Gratuity. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's such a privilege to be able to share some of these stories with you. Farming is such a global and diverse practice. And for those who intimately know it, you could argue it really makes up the backbone of many societies. What have you found to be true with all the female farmers you've met and have been talking with recently in the developing pandemic situation and their roles in society and how that might be changing. I have to agree with you. I mean, agriculture is the backbone of our society. It's the backbone of our economy. You know, it's something that every single one of us uses all day long, every day. This really is kind of an, an opportunity for us to really be grateful for a lot of those invisible workers that we may have been taking sort of for granted for a long time. It's been interesting with my project. I have been studying sort of the modern day farmer, but I've also sort of been looking to the past to see sort of the trend of women farmers and what they do. And what I've seen is that over history, in times of crisis, women farmers really step up and feed communities and clothe communities. And this is going to be no different for the female farmers of today. And they really are like rising to the occasion. I'm seeing a lot of female farmers really doing some interesting and cool things to help get the communities, you know, in their communities fed, getting food to the, the people, which is great. Now, as the director and founder of the Female Farmer Project, can you share some of the background of your work with female farmers in general and what you've been doing uh, in the last few weeks? I started this project some time ago, about seven years ago. It may have been even longer than that because I was standing in the middle of the farmer's market and I was just sort of looking around and, and observing how the farmers were interacting with each other at the market and how they were interacting with the customers. It dawned on me that behind every single table was a woman and it was sort of the absence of men that made me sort Sort of like wake up to the idea that these women that farm in my community were the landowners, they're the entrepreneurs and business owners, the employers, and the economic engine of my community. I found it so sort of distressing that I never thought about them in that way, that, you know, for some reason I had taken them for granted or really, you know, not really considered them in a way that they should be considered. And so I spent some time researching at the library, trying to find why it was that I had sort of fallen into that trap of thinking that only men farmed. And in that process, I discovered that there was a reason that women were sort of missing and disappeared from the history, not only from agriculture, but, you know, really from history. You know, women only occupy about one half of 1% of written history. And, and in agriculture, that's certainly true. You know, women were just missing from the data. They're missing from art. They're missing from the photos. And there are consequences when groups of people are not counted. And so over time, the project started as sort of a photography project. I thought, you know, I would put sort of the woman farmer back on the map visually. And then it became, you know, a way to amplify women's stories. And I did that through, you know, essays that I wrote and some of them began to contribute essays to the project. And then we started adding a podcast because we found that farmers didn't have a whole lot of time to sit down in front of a computer and read a story. Very busy. 
Yeah, very, I mean, you know, and really on the go, you know, from the time the sun is up till the time the sun is down, and then in the evening, who wants to sit in front of a computer and read? So by taking those stories and putting them in their pockets so that they can, you know, listen to these stories or hear, you know, information about how other farmers are doing it and doing it well, you know, they can take that with them into the barn and, while they're mucking the stalls or take it with them into the combine while they're spending hours planting or harvesting. And that has become, you know, a really fun and interesting way to get information out to farmers. But I think I knew from the very beginning that this had to be a film and it had to be on public television, that we needed mm. to tell the stories not only of the farmers of today because they inherited a legacy. And that legacy is of these women who throughout history, like I said, have stepped up in times of crisis and fed their communities and fed America. That is sort of like an encapsulation of what the Female Farmer Project is and what the women's work documentary is. I mean, it's so important for you to be shining a spotlight on this, especially as you mentioned that history has not been kind in remembering or recognizing a lot of the women's roles in farming and agriculture, both in America, but then also internationally. And even before the pandemic broke out, there was a shift in women and their relationship to farming and many people even leaving the corporate world to come and start cultivating their own farms. So how do you see that changing role to progress in the immediate and near future as we deal with the pandemic and then also maybe even a little beyond that? I've studied how women have been accessing agriculture because they were sort of kind of locked out of the typical and conventional way of farming. And that was, you know, through inheriting it, right? So we, we saw often that it was the sons of the farmers who were inheriting the farms and the daughters were kind of locked out of that. And how they would access agriculture was either through marrying it and then carving out their own relationship with agriculture within their husband's farm. Or if their husband had passed away, then they weren't inheriting this farm. Or, you know, if they inherited it from their father, which was up until recently very rare. It's interesting, we're seeing sort of a combination of that, as well as this whole new generation of first generation farmers, these women who have actually been in business, you know, and they're bringing, you know, those skill sets into agriculture from lawyers and accountants and software developers. And they're bringing a really interesting perspective into agriculture. But how they access the land and the markets is very much relationship oriented. So it's a lot of small community farm stands, farmers markets, direct to consumer through CSAs, which is community supported agriculture. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means. And then um, also, you know, direct to restaurants. But what we're seeing now is that, you know, because that was sort of the old way of doing agriculture. And now there's been, you know, women accessing agriculture that way and building their own system, that that's how a lot of people are thinking today. Now that we're in this crisis, you know, potentially having labor shortages and having, you know, potential, you know, closures of borders and all of these things, people are starting to think in terms of local. And that includes local food. And that's a majority of what we're seeing is, you know, the women are running that local food system. Many of them were relying on restaurant sales and school sales, and that's switched so very quickly. And so these women are having to pivot on a dime and they are flexible and they are nimble and they are doing it and they are getting local food out to people in need very quickly it's really really just inspiring i had a farmer email me last night that they have pivoted completely to delivering fresh vegetables to people who are vulnerable you know our senior citizens and they're setting it up on their website so that you know we can get their information and this farm is just going to be delivering only you know door to door to these folks i mean that's so amazing and a lot of people still might think of farms as these giant swaths of land in the middle of america but especially in urban areas, you're seeing more small farms, quarter acre plots of lands, things like that. Are you going to see the roles of those get even more and more important as people maybe for the first time start to think about where their food comes from and how to get easier access to it? than just going to a supermarket. I talked to a farmer yesterday. August is typically their peak. And this past week, they 
doubled their numbers from August. So people are really shifting their mindset to ingredients versus going to the grocery store and getting, you know, prepared, whatever, you know, majority of agriculture still is those swaths of land, you know, we've got Iowa is mostly soybeans now and corn. And that is so important today. We cannot discount that because they are providing all of the feed for, you know, the livestock. And, you know, we need that as well, right? We need the, you know, the the protein sources, you know, up until recently, dairy was really struggling. And I hope that this is sort of a shot in the arm for the dairy business, you know, that they are still producing milk. You know, nothing has changed for the farmers per se, you know, they're still waking up at dawn and working through the day and producing food. And we should say that there is no shortage of food. You know, there is plenty of food in this country. You know, there is no disruption in our food production. Looking ahead, there's potentially, you know, a shortage in labor. I'm really excited that people are looking to local food. You know, here in Washington state, we're about, I'd say two to three weeks ahead of the rest of the country and sort of us sort of locking down and staying home, figuring this out sort of ahead of the country and then seeing everybody sort of like spin up very quickly into what we've been doing for some time now. While our the city of Seattle did close down farmers markets statewide, they are still allowed to have markets. And so we're seeing that a lot of these farms are selling out for the first time ever. I mean, that's incredible. So it really is like this sort of, you know, like boost in the arm for local food. The problem is that we're sort of at the end of our storage vegetable season here in Washington state and moving into planting season. So there's this kind of gap of what we have available. But yeah, people are buying up the storage. I mean, one farmer said to me, I wondered what it would take to sell out of beets and, you know, other, you know, stranger vegetables to people. And she says, and now I know what it took. (laughs) In a lot of your writings and your podcasts and things like that, you really do show in times of labor shortages or worker shortages, women have really stepped up to carry the load you're going to see that gap filled again by women. What have you seen? What have you heard recently in the last few weeks or looking to the future of uh, women really stepping into the workforce when it comes to farming and agriculture and farmers markets? Let's first look to the past. You know, World War I and World War II, women from all walks of life left their families, their universities, and they served the nation by working in factories, but lesser known, they also took over the farms. You know, everybody hears about Rosie the Riveter, but women also, and this is so interesting to me, and I cannot believe that we don't know about this generally, and it's part of our film, is that they donned uniforms and went, and they were become, they became part of the U.S. Crop Corps. So women sort of, you know, like marched onto the farms and took over. And the people who talk about that time talk about the farms never ran more streamlined and more well than when the women had taken over. And then during the farm crisis in the 80s, it was the women who were holding the families and communities together. My friend, the late Mona Lee Brock, she was a true angel during those times. I mean, she and her husband had lost their farm in Oklahoma, and she became sort of this de facto farm crisis counselor, and she saved countless lives, hundreds and hundreds of farmers from suicide by picking up the phone and counseling these farmers through the crisis. So we are going to see this again. Women are stepping up and delivering food to the most vulnerable people in our communities. They are, you know, pivoting from... Um, you know, the restaurant and grocer to making sure that, you know, there's direct to consumer. It's exciting to see this kind of in real time too. You know, it's something I think about a lot historically, and this is an historic time. Yes. So I think um, during this crisis, yeah, we are going to definitely see women farmers step up. I mean, the little things, like I had a man farmer contact me yesterday and he said, if it weren't for the women farmers in his life, he wouldn't be able to pivot like he has. It mm-hmm. was women farmers who showed him how to set up his website, how to set up all the online ordering, because women farmers have had to do that all along anyway. And so, you know, now they're in turn sort of helping, you know, some of the male farmers get set up so that they can do it as well. And that really warmed my heart that he took the time to reach out to me to say that he was really grateful to the women farmers in his life to help get him set up so that he could start helping and serving as well. You bring up a good point 
about mental health and the pressure and needing to pivot during these times. And you have been a longtime advocate for mental health when it comes to farming, because it is a, like you said, every day, up at dawn, all day, endless cycle of work. And when these times, the hard times happen, it can feel very crushing and it can feel very lonely or you can feel despondent. What have farmers been sharing with you recently about their own mental health? And what advice have you been giving for people who are going through this right now, who are going to have to really pull a 180 on their whole lifestyle. I mean, anyone who's running a market out of Seattle right now, the farmer's market, has to reevaluate their entire way of their making a living or getting their goods out and things like that. I'm hearing sort of both things. I, you know, I have heard from some farmers who have said that this is such an incredible opportunity and they feel really grateful that they're able to be able to sort of step in and help. But also we have to remember that 25% of rural America does not have broadband. I can't say it enough that broadband needs to be a utility. You know, everybody needs to have access because especially during this time, you know, farmers are the original social distancers, right? But the job by definition is sort of like this, you know, physically, you know, solitary job. But now more than ever, they can't leave their farm and sort of go be social at the coffee shop now. And so everybody's being socially connected via the internet and you know, 25% of rural America not having that access, that's devastating to me. So I think I'm hoping that that would be a silver lining at the end of this is that we really focus on getting everybody broadband as a utility. But yes, the social distancing is going to be challenging for a lot of people. And I encourage everybody to sort of adopt a farmer, you know, it's nice to say that, you know, you know, your local bartender or your local restaurateur or your, you know, local grocer or what have you, but know your local farmer yeah. too and check in with them and you know it's nice to say that you know my farmer you know and know who they are and their kids names and you know be able to drop by or send them an email and check in I mean that's I think they you know we forget farmers and you know there's a big portion of the food system the workers are invisible. It's not just the farmers, it's the truck drivers, it's the packers, it's the processors. You know, this is invisible labor that we should always be considering. And now especially, you know, these people are creative and they are filled with grit and they are stewards, but we also need to consider them and take care of them as they are taking care of us. The advice I would be giving to everybody, not just farmers, is take good care of yourself. You know, nourish your body, practice balance and moderation. And and, you know, uh, get rest and stay hydrated and work locally, but think globally. Is there anything that you can practice or put into practice that would allow for that balance? Because I think people are looking for actual tips as well, because people can hear, oh, I should balance my life. I should do this. I should take a walk around the block. But what is some of the advice that you've you've given of the actual practical steps for people who need to find balance during this time, especially since we're going to be in this for a bit of a long haul? I think boundaries are important. You know, now that time feels blurred, it's easy to allow your own boundaries to be not respected and to not respect other people's boundaries, you know? So I found myself working through the weekend because I just had, you know, here I am on week four of self-isolating and I am losing sense of time. Right. And so you know, finding a way to begin and end your day as far as working is really important and really do set boundaries. And, you know, don't ask a farmer if you can stop by at 8 p.m. to pick up eggs, you know, and farmers tell them no, if they do call, you know, I am hearing from farmers who are saying that, you know, people think that it's vacation and that they could come out to the farm and feed the baby goats. And the farmers are saying, no, please stay away. <laughs> we are working really hard to produce your food and we cannot at this time, you know, sacrifice sacrifice our health in order to entertain people on the farm. This is not vacation. This is not spring break. Healthy boundaries and demand that people respect them and respect other people's boundaries. Getting good rest is, you know, everybody says that, but really like set your alarm if you need to, to remind yourself to go to bed. Right. And when you wake up, make your bed. Cause that's kind of, you know, it seems like a silly thing, but you know, it's really nice to get into a made bed. Oh, it's the best. Tuck corners and everything. Yes, I love it. I love it. There's nothing that... <laughs> one farmer told me that she takes 100 deep breaths a day, and I thought that was really good advice. Oh, that's amazing. And build fun into your day. Take time to laugh. Take time to laugh, to dance a little. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I've been, you know, DJ Nice has been doing some great parties and I've been having, you know, little dance sessions in my own office and yeah, move your body with love. I love that. I'd like to shift and start looking toward the future of this a little bit because we're in it right now, but we're going to get through this. And I want to hope that there's some positivity that comes through on the other end because there's a lot of pain right now. There's a lot of sadness and people are scared. But I think what we have, especially when we look to farming and problems in the past, you know, you look at the Dust Bowl, you look at the Depression, you look at world wars. But, you know, farming has always come through and and many times come through stronger on the other side. So do you see a chance for farming to develop? I know you had talked a little bit about people recognizing the farmers and a shot in the arm to the dairy industry. But do you see a chance for maybe for less discrimination? Do you see women and people who are working the fields having more respect? and more acceptance as they help usher us through this tough time. I really think it would be a dream scenario that we would come out on the other side of this as a softer, kinder people who have a much greater appreciation for the people who are the invisible workers in our food system and the diversity that exists in our food system. That would be a silver lining. Another silver lining would be a sense of creating a self-reliance for ourselves but also in a community-minded way. One of the uh, farmers that I spoke to here in my community, she grew up in uh, a war-torn Bosnia. Because of that, the war brought about this sort of complete collapse of the food system in her country. So all of this complicated web of food transportation and imports and exports just gave way to really surviving on humanitarian aid. So they had to learn to survive on staples like flour and powdered milk. And so everybody turned patches of grass into gardens. And she Mm. remembers how there was all these little gardens and everybody was becoming self-reliant and growing their own food. You know, in balconies, there was gardens grown out of every single sort of container people could find. And she remembers that they had to learn to cook without eggs and without butter, but that they would exchange recipes while standing in food lines. That feels a little bit like we can learn some of those lessons today, you know, that, you know, here she was this war refugee and she's a first generation immigrant and she settled here Washington State and she married and had a few children, but she kept feeling that call to return to the growing of her own food. And so she started farming a couple of years ago. So there is sort of, for me, an appreciation for that community-minded self-reliance. And I think that might be, you know, sort of a, a silver lining of this as well. You know, people are nervous about the global supply chain, but you mentioned that Farms are operating like business as usual, and the only thing that might see some disruption are maybe people who are going to work or people being able to get access to their food. So what are some tips that people can follow as this keeps unfolding in getting food or even becoming self-reliant? Is it baking your own bread? Is it planting your own herbs? Is it you know, doing forging and things like that. Our food system here in the United States is so safe and it's so secure. And really it is quite elegant, but it does rely on a lot of transportation. And there isn't a a lot of folks who are willing to do long haul transportation right now. So things are sort of, I think, you know, shifting to think locally. The labor shortage as far as harvesting is becoming, you know, sort of planting and harvesting, you know, the H2A visa workers were supposed to just about start arriving right about now. And for people who don't know, the H-2A visa workers are the non-immigrant seasonal workforce that come from, you know, outside of our borders. And they're an integral part of this system. And I don't know what's going to happen with that. I haven't found any stories about it. I looked all over to see. And apparently, you know, in Mexico, they're all staying in hotels around the U.S. Embassy. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of confusion about what's going to happen next. I'm not sure. But for now, everything is, you know, working the way it's supposed to. And that's great. I grow a small garden every year and I've already started my little seedlings indoors and getting ready to move some of them outdoors. And, you know, not everybody has that opportunity, but you can support a local farmer by buying into a CSA. And I promised to tell you what a CSA was. CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And what that means is that you buy a share into the farm for that season. So you are paying the farmer up front for all the vegetables that you're going to get through this season. So you may pay, say, 
$600, but every week you get a share of the harvest of that farm. How that is helpful to the farmer is that it allows them to buy the seed that they're going to be planting. So it's kind of a financial investment in the farm and in yourself, you know, and if the farmer fails, let's say, you know, the tomatoes get some kind of blight, then that means that you take that loss with the farmer and you don't have tomatoes from your farm share that week. But, you know, if there's, you know, extra carrots, then you get to share in that. So it's really an interesting model in learning about seasonality and learning about sort of the the labor and the efforts that it takes to produce this kind of food. But more importantly, the seasonality. I mean, I think we have been spoiled to death of, you know, being able to go to the grocery store and getting strawberries in January, unless you live in Florida, then you can have strawberries in January. But (laughs) yes. Oh, and sometimes in, well, not California, but depends. Yeah. I mean, I do believe that that concept of farm to table or local and seasonal is going to become more accepted. I think people are going to shift and thinking that these are the fruits we have in January, February, March, and then this is what we can have during the summer. And Maybe it becomes more special when you can only have an avocado when you're supposed to have an avocado. Right. I mean, for me, it is. You know, I try not to eat raw tomatoes for the most part through the winter so that when it comes time for tomatoes, oh, yeah. I am desperate for that taste. Oh, I'm with you. I will wait. I will wait <laughs> all winter. And there's nothing like it, right? <laughs> oh, my God. That first, like, summer tomato with some sea salt. Oh, I know. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, and the same for me, you know, even right now, A lot of the like purple sprouting broccoli is coming on and that first taste, like that's the harbinger of spring for me. It's like when I get that first taste of purple sprouting broccoli. So for me, it's worthwhile holding off and eating seasonally because man, it's gratifying and it's so delicious and it marks the seasons for me. I love it. So I want to bring it back a little full circle because you did mention that there is a silver lining to all of this and there is some positive change that's coming. And I want to end on asking you if you think that because of this situation, because of the pandemic, that more women are going to get into farming, both on a local level, but maybe even at a commercial level as well. Yeah, I I really hope so. I think being a farmer is almost like being a public servant, you know, and I think women really are drawn to those kinds of jobs. And, you know, I'm not saying just women are, but women really tend to be drawn to that sort of serving the community and nourishing the community and organizing. That's just been sort of the trend throughout time of that's how women work. And it would be really great to see that that's how folks are drawn to farming when they see how integral (laughs) they're so important to our system. And we, you know, as a community should value them just as we should value our school teachers and our doctors and all of the other public servants. Farmers should be held in that same self, you know, that same esteem. I'll say right now, anyone who is doing their own homeschooling or daycare can understand why teachers are underpaid and need to be paid a very hefty salary because it is unbelievable work they do and to all the doctors as well thank you yeah we'll find that teachers and farmers are underpaid by a lot (laughs) yes audra i cannot thank you enough for all the work you've been doing and taking the time to talk with us if people want to know more about the female farmer project or the documentary or just get in touch with you where can they go i think probably the easiest place would be my Instagram account that's rooted in the valley and there I usually will um, update everybody about what's going on and link people to interesting articles and podcasts. So that's a great place to start. If you want to learn more about our podcast, you can find it on every streaming platform and that's Female Farmer Podcast. Our website is femalefarmerproject.org and there's lots of really beautiful articles and essays written by the farmers themselves and my portraits of a lot of the farmers that um, you know people might find inspiring during this time. And then our film documentary is on womensworkdoc.org and there we have our um, trailer which is really inspirational and, and will give you chills when you think about you know how important women have been throughout history and in the feeding of our communities and our country so that's a great place for everybody to come learn more and honestly you know the gratitude is all on my end thank you so much for allowing me to amplify some of these stories with you today it's been great I mean that your audience you know they all care 
care about food and they all care about farmers. So I'm really grateful for this time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we really appreciate it. Please do reach out if you have any questions about anything that Audra is working on. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Gratuity. Thank you so much to Audra for taking the time to chat with us. If you want to get in touch or have any questions or need information, please write us at gratuity at casemade.com. We've also included some links to what Audra is working on and some of the resources for the Female Farmer Project, along with the Women's Work documentary. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.